The Colorado is one of the great rivers of the world. It flows through some of North America's most dramatic scenery. Indeed, it was responsible for creating the awe-inspiring landscapes along its course. Today, the wild Colorado no longer flows freely to the sea. It's been harnessed and tamed. More than half the American West and even part of Mexico make use of its waters. Great dams block the river. They might be impressive feats of engineering, but they rob the Colorado of water and sap its energy. Only one stretch has survived almost unscathed. For its first 25 miles, the Colorado is still a wild river. Yet even here it's threatened. Its water is being abstracted for many purposes, with the result that even these last few wild miles are now at risk. For most of its length, the Colorado has been tamed beyond recognition. These upper reaches have been protected since 1915 as part of the Rocky Mountain National Park. Here, it's still possible to find at least a trace of the old wild river. Lynx and bobcats were once a familiar sight. Now they're seldom seen. Grizzly bears and wolves were eliminated altogether by the early settlers. Bighorn sheep have fared better. They were almost wiped out by trophy hunters, but their numbers have since recovered. The Colorado belongs to Western America. It drains a larger area than any other American river, but so much water is diverted on its 1,400-mile journey that outside periods of flood, not a drop reaches the sea. Four hundred miles upstream from its estuary in Mexico, the Hoover Dam dominates the landscape. Completed in 1935, it was acclaimed as the first major success in harnessing the Colorado. It's still the largest of its kind in the world. Today, 14 more dams block the river. Their massive walls bring the Colorado to a standstill. Higher upstream, the river passes through one of the natural wonders of the world, the Grand Canyon a mile deep and 280 miles long. Further upstream still, its course crosses the border into the state of Colorado, where high in the Rocky Mountains, 70 miles northwest of Denver, the river has its source. Very little was known about this region until the middle of the 19th century. The Rockies were one of the last areas in America to be explored. The source of the Colorado was found in 1849, but it was 1869 before the first expedition set out to map its course. In 1915, few Westerners cared about wildlife. Fortunately, the residents of this region were concerned. 
largely through the perseverance and dedication of a local naturalist called Enos Mills, with the support of President Theodore Roosevelt, the government was persuaded to set aside this part of the Rockies as a national park. A pale March sun takes the chill off the air and winter slowly loosens its grip. The thaw has begun in earnest and the valley echoes to the sound of melting ice and snow. The lengthening days bring new life to the mountains. A golden eagle is drawn up from the valley below. A marmot on sentry go sounds the alarm. The little mouse hares, or pikers, add their own warning signals. A wary piker goes to ground. She will stay here with her newborn young until the danger has passed. Drifting on updrafts, the eagle hangs effortlessly on the wind as it scans the slopes for prey. succeeds only in aggravating a pair of ravens. The ravens mob it until they drive it away. In spring, the river valley echoes to the unearthly sound of male sage grouse at their traditional courtship arenas called booming grounds. Inflatable air sacs increase the resonance of the calls, attracting females from miles around. Birds stage ritual fights to establish territories within the arena. Only the most vigorous birds, commanding a central position, will have a chance with the hens when they arrive. In the mountains above the river, the spring runoff collects in a natural basin. Over the years, a bog has formed, a giant sponge holding millions of gallons of melting snow. 
This natural reservoir at the head of the valley provides the river with a constant supply of water. The bog is treacherously soft, yet many animals find a refuge here. A muskrat is happier in water than out of it. It's smaller than its relative the beaver and lacks the broad tail, but it's still a strong swimmer. The soft mud at the water's edge is alive with insects, crustaceans and worms. An American robin gathers food for her growing brood. Water dribbles from the bog through a maze of ditches and furrows. Drawn together in La Poudre Pass, they form the headwaters of the Colorado River, the starting point of its long but thwarted journey to the sea. Even at its source, the Colorado is fed not only with pure runoff, but with seepage from a man-made ditch. For an explanation, we need to look no further than a few steps above the bog. The battle for water begins before a drop reaches the river. In 1890, before this area was protected, Chinese and Swedish laborers were hired to dig an enormous ditch that now diverts three quarters of the meltwater before it even reaches the bog. From the air, the grand ditch looks like a mountain road. It runs for 14 miles, taking water once destined for the river to irrigate dry pastures in the east. Shortage of water is the most serious threat to the wildlife in the river today. But as long as enough meltwater escapes the ditch, life will flourish in the river below. This dam is a recent addition to the landscape. It's the work of a beaver. At the edge of the pond, which forms behind the dam, these large rodents build a lodge made of stones and branches and cemented together with mud. A beaver is slow moving and vulnerable on land. Repairs to the lodge are usually carried out at night, but sometimes the sun rises before the work is finished. The entrance to the lodge is below the surface. The chamber inside is warm and dry, and it's here in early spring that the female gives birth to her kits, from two to four in number. Beavers were nearly wiped out by the fur trappers. By the late 19th century, there were practically none left in the river. Since then, the Colorado has changed irreversibly, and along most of its length, the beavers will never return. A few still survive where the river runs through protected wilderness.
Below the Beaver Dam, the Colorado flows freely again. Clear, fast-flowing rivers are the favorite haunt of the American Dipper. It's too early yet for flying insects, but there are plenty of larvae below the surface for the Dipper to eat. Its favorite nest site is by a waterfall, a precarious place to raise young, but the river in full spate provides excellent protection from predators. Well-oiled feathers and a thick layer of down keep the bird warm and dry. In the wild water, its long toes and strong claws grip the bottom. It can even search for food in whirlpools and rapids without being swept away. From the moment they hatch, dippers are well adapted for life by the river. These chicks are about two weeks old. They can't fly at this stage, but they can swim. Even if the nest is flooded, they'll stand a good chance of survival. Water diversion poses a real threat to a bird that thrives only in mountain streams. Reducing the water supply makes the river sluggish and unsuitable for dippers. June, the banks have burst into flower, a rich source of pollen and nectar that attracts visitors from the south, including several species of hummingbird. To provide for their chicks, the adults must search continuously for food. Foraging rights over the nectar-rich blooms are keenly contested. In the damp flood meadows, a profusion of flowers grows all summer, so hummingbird chicks raised near the river have the best chance of survival. The Colorado River influences the lives of most of the valley's animals. During the long dry days of summer, it's the only reliable source of water. The mountain lion, a stealthy hunter, is seldom seen, and a glimpse into its private life is a rare privilege. The lionesses give birth to between one and six cubs in a secluded den, usually in July. By the time they're three weeks old, the cubs' eyes have opened and their mother introduces them to the world outside.
mountain lions were once widespread throughout North America. Today they're scarce, and some people still regard them as a threat to livestock. Few individuals managed to survive in the most inaccessible valleys above the river. There, free from persecution, they roam unharmed and their numbers are slowly increasing. The river otter was not so lucky. These beautiful creatures were hunted out in the upper reaches of the Colorado by the late 1950s. Forty individuals were recently reintroduced here and the first reports on their progress are encouraging but their future depends on the fate of the river. Eight miles downstream from La Poudre Pass, the river changes character. Deeper, less turbulent stretches with steep banks are favorite haunts of the belted kingfisher. These birds excavate a tunnel ending in a nest chamber three to four feet into the bank. The adult birds are kept busy during the breeding season. They must catch more than 50 small fish a day to feed their family. From its perch above the water, the kingfisher can pinpoint a fish from 20 feet. Kingfishers like their prey dead, or at least immobile, before they swallow it whole, head first. This is a female, distinguished by her rusty belly band and flanks. Kingfishers usually dive to a depth of two or three feet, avoiding shallower water. By June, as the water level begins to drop, the question for all the animals that depend on the river is, will it fall too far? In September, the quaking aspens along the Colorado River change color. Their golden leaves tremble in the slightest breeze. Autumn is a time of peace and tranquility. It's breathtakingly beautiful, but it soon passes. Shorter days and colder nights signal the approach of winter. The animals can sense the change. They start preparing for the long, cold months ahead. Ten miles downstream from its source, a pair of beavers have dammed the river. In the past, this would have been impossible. The Colorado was once so powerful that it would have smashed any obstacle in its path, even so early in its course. Last winter's snowfall was below average and so much meltwater drained away down the Grand Ditch that by autumn the river had lost what power remained to it. The beaver dam is built of branches and tree trunks which the animals fell and then haul into the water.
this family is busy laying in food for the winter. Willow and aspen branches, stockpiled at the edge of the pond, will see them through when the water freezes. Although they're no longer trapped for their pelts, the beavers are persecuted as pests outside the park. Within its boundaries, however, they're left in peace. As the days grow colder, herds of elk move down from the mountains for the start of the rut. The bull's eerie bugling carries far in the frosty air, warning all rivals that he alone is master of his harem and reminding the cows of his dominance over them. These majestic animals once roamed throughout North America. Now the Rockies are their only remaining stronghold. As the bugling dies away among the mountains, a new sound is heard from the slopes above the river. A clash of horns marks the beginning of the bighorn breeding season. The rams fight furiously for the right to mate. Their head-on encounters can be heard a mile away. Remarkably, the rams come to no harm. Their massive horns and air cavities in their skulls absorb the shock. By the time the first snow falls, the whole area has become a battlefield. Deep in the forests, the mule deer are fighting for dominance. The sight of a buck with large antlers is usually enough to deter a younger challenger. Fights occur only when the two males are evenly matched.
encounters are seldom fatal, although many bucks will carry broken antlers by the end of the season, testifying to the intensity of the jousting. By the end of November, freezing air currents from the west bring the first winter blizzards to the mountains. animals retreat to the relative safety of the forests in the valley below. There, a porcupine, its back to the wind, braves the bitter weather. For the next five months, the Rockies will be ravaged by high winds and snowstorms. Out in the open, life is impossible. The animals must find shelter or die. As winter tightens its grip, all rivalries are forgotten. The mule deer bucks reach a truce. Their struggle now is to find enough food to stay alive. In the valley below, the sun drives back the freezing fog to bring a short but welcome break in the weather. The swift current stops the bitterly cold river from icing over. At the end of November, kokanee salmon run up the Colorado to spawn. The freezing water fails to cool their ardor. Rocks break the current, offering the fish pockets of sheltered water in which to rest before the next push upstream. On their arrival at the spawning beds, the salmon jostle for mates in the shallows. This male is ready to spawn. At the moment of laying, he sheds sperm into the water to fertilize his mate's eggs. The female covers the eggs with gravel to stop them floating off downstream and to hide them from predators. The river is the dipper's private larder. It can always find food underwater, even when the temperature is well below freezing. Exposed salmon eggs are easily spotted from the surface and stand little chance of survival. The dipper is master of two worlds. It has conquered the air and is equally at home in the water.
Once the salmon have spawned, their race is run. One by one they die and take on a new role in the food chain, providing a welcome feast for resident ducks. A mist rises from the valley floor and the shrouded river attracts a new visitor. More and more bald eagles come to the upper reaches of the Colorado every year. This is a young bird on its first visit. Salmon were only recently introduced to the Colorado River. The eagles have been quick to recognize a plentiful food supply. Resident ravens scavenge alongside them. They're constantly harassed, but still manage to find enough to eat. The introduction of the salmon has benefited dippers, ducks, and especially the majestic eagles. When the salmon are gone, the bitter cold will eventually drive the eagles south. Others too must flee for their lives. This time the snowshoe hare escapes. Broad furry feet enable it to stay one jump ahead of the lion, which sinks to its belly at every step. The frozen flood meadows are a favorite hunting ground for the only common large predator in the area. Cunning and resourceful, the coyotes have proved impossible to eradicate. They keep in touch with each other by howling. Mice and voles remain active all winter under the snow. The coyote can't see or smell them, but its sharp ears can hear them.
The harsh Rocky Mountain winter keeps the area isolated for months. In summer, that isolation comes abruptly to an end. Tourism has reached the Rockies. The fact that the last remaining wild stretch of the Colorado runs through the region adds to its attraction. Each year, the number of visitors increases. They come in their millions from all over the world to visit this part of the river. The temptation to feed the animals is irresistible. The extra rations enable many species to raise an unnaturally high number of young. But few people consider the fate of these creatures when the tourists have gone. The land cannot support them all, and many will starve to death in the winter. These animals are highly adapted to life in the mountains. They can't cope easily with disturbance or change. Visitors, unless they stick to the rules, pose a threat to the very creatures they have come to admire. 25 miles downstream from its source, the river runs into its first major obstacle. Shadow Mountain is not the biggest dam on the Colorado, but it is the first, and it marks the end of the Wild River. Within the next six miles, there is another dam, two reservoirs, a system to pump water back up the river, and an aqueduct through a mountain. The flood meadows below the dam are now ranch land. The trees have been cleared to make way for cattle. There's little room for wildlife here. The signs of change are clearly visible, but they're not all bad. The reservoirs provide a winter refuge for waterfowl. In cold weather, hundreds of geese and ducks fly in to shelter from storms further north. The diverted and stored water is used to raise cattle and crops and in the homes of the ranchers and farmers. It fills swimming pools and waters lawns and golf courses. In winter it makes snow for ski resorts. It enables millions of people to live comfortably in an area thought uninhabitable a century ago, but at a heavy cost in terms of wildlife and wild places. Human ingenuity has tamed and robbed the once wild and mighty Colorado. New schemes are planned to take even more water from the river, but the long-term effects remain unknown. 
it's already clear that for most of its length, the native animals and plants are suffering, and many have become extinct. Without strict controls, removing more water may mean the end of the wild Colorado.